Hello, history friends. It's Mr. Nugent here. Today, we're going to be looking at some of the first topics that you will be covering or that you have been covering in the advanced placement with government and politics course, specifically looking at topics 1.1 which is titled Ideals of Democracy. So in previous videos, we've already kind of gone a little bit ahead of this, but was taking a step back to the foundations. So throughout this series, we're gonna be looking at key concepts, key ideas, and key documents that are covered in the Advanced Placement Government and Politics course for units one through unit five. So there's a couple, uh, there's a couple uh, I, I understandings that we're gonna be looking at specifically in this in this video today. I'm trying to not spend too much time on it, not trying not to make the video too long. However, we need to make sure that we do the the concepts justice, make sure that we provide a strong overview of the concepts that are covered in topics one point one of the AP government and politics course. So in the ideals of democracy, which is topic 1.1, there is a major objective that you're gonna be looking at, and that's kind of the underlying objective that's covered through majority of unit one, which is looking at this question of an objective of you being able to, at the end, to be able to explain how democratic ideals are reflected in the Declaration of Independence, which we're gonna be looking at today, or the DOI, which sometimes the acronyms used for it, and the United States Constitution, or just the US Constitution. There is some essential knowledge that is expected for you to be able to take away from this topic throughout your taking of this course. The first of the essential knowledge is the US government is based on ideas of limited government, including natural rights, popular sovereignty, republicanism, and the social contract. So these are foundational ideals and concepts that are covered in the AP government politics course and will be covered in this overview video as well. The second essential knowledge that you'll be looking at is this idea that the Declaration of Independence drafted by Jefferson with help from John Adams and Benjamin Franklin provides a foundation for popular sovereignty while the US Constitution drafted at the Philadelphia Convention and led by George Washington with important contributions from Madison, Hamilton, and members of the Grand Committee, provides the blueprint for which a unique form of political democracy in the US. So essentially the DOI is known as being the most famous breakup letter of all time, whereas the colonies broke away from the strongest empire at the time, Great Britain, and some of the ramifications of that. So essentially, that was the breakup letter, and the, the, the U.S. Constitution is their blueprint for moving forward. So we're going to be covering that over the course of the next couple videos. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing a quick overview. So the Declaration of Independence is a fairly decent sized document. So what we're going to be doing is extracting some of the text from it and then providing a quick summary. So that way you, at the end of this video, you're able to understand the gists of what's covered. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing is, I'm sharing my screen, and we are going to be taking and looking specifically at the Declaration of Independence summary. <clears throat> So what, what, what this video, what this document's doing is taking some of the key excerpts from the document and then providing a very brief summary statement of what that entire paragraph was talking about, what the main idea was as it's been extracted. So in Congress on July 4th, 1776, unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. So in the first paragraph, the very first sentence is, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions in mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. So in just this entire introductory paragraph is saying, when it becomes necessary to end one political process due to lack of representation, it's only fair to list the reasons why. So that's essentially what this first paragraph is doing is it's providing the foundation to why they're breaking away, 
the fact that they're breaking away, why they're breaking away, and then how throughout the rest of this declaration, the authors are going to be providing the evidence and the justifications that have led to there being no other course of action. Very similar to like a divorce settlement where someone states in the causes being irreconcilable differences is pretty much what the colonists were doing in this document. They were pretty much saying that at this point in time, there's nothing that we can do moving forward to keep this union together. It is, it is too far gone. And that's essentially what's being covered. Now we make our way over to the, the second paragraph, which is one of the most important that's been quoted so many, so many times, which the, I'm just gonna read the first passage of it. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So this excerpt here was extracted from some of the philosophies that were constructed at the time by John Locke, which his, his argument was that you have life you cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property. So a slight deviation from, Locke's, from the Lockean ideals, however, very similar premises. So the summary of this is, we believe that everyone is created equal and should be afforded the right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness as they see it. We believe these rights a fundamental truth and no government's right to curtail now and forevermore, which is a summary of what's being covered in the second paragraph. <clears throat> As we make our way down to the third paragraph, instead of reading through excerpts from the top, I'm just going to read the summaries moving forward. That way we can kind of get the gist of what's being covered in each one of these paragraphs without allowing this video to be coming too, too long. So in the third paragraph, the summary is that to protect these rights, governments are designed by and get their powers from its people. And when any design of government begins to remove their freedom, it's the sole responsibility of the people to repair this disconnect or to replace this government that's no longer working in favor of the people of that nation. Now we make our way down to the fourth paragraph. And the summary of the fourth paragraph states that we shouldn't change government lightly. However, for when we do, people suffer. Therefore, it's important that whatever form of governing process we agree on, we build it well. When, however, though, through any actions, this governing body we create seeks to reduce our civil liberties or reduce our ability to self-govern, it's only our right and it's our civic obligation within any republic to amend or throw off such governments and to provide a new governing body that supports civil liberties for all now and for future generations. To enjoy civil liberties, our participation and maintaining their security lands squarely on us, those who live under them. So again, providing the justification of uh, when things happen, when you're no longer having a government that's working in your best interest, it is your obligation to either fix this disconnect or to remove those who are in power that are disenfranchising you. The next paragraph, the summary of it is looking at the King of England's record. It's clear England wants a total control of our colonies, compromising our liberties. And now in the next paragraph, it starts to state out the grievances and the facts as to, to, to solidify this argument that King George and the rest of the English parliament wants nothing to do with the colonies, but to control them as slaves. So now we start going to the grievances. The first grievance is he won't allow us to create our own laws, a fundamental need for the things to work here. The next grievance is he won't let us pass important laws we need now. He go, he, he's he got to sign off on them, and when he doesn't, we suffer. He refused to let us pass laws affecting large groups of people in our colonies unless they swore allegiance to him, even though they've had the right to self-govern, clearly showing he's a tyrant. He requests meetings of representation, representatives in faraway, cold, and strange places for the purpose of wearing them down into submission so they'll agree with him. He's disbanded our leaders whenever we complain about human rights abuses. He, by, allowing, by not allowing us to self-govern in any capacity, it opens our colonies up for corruption from within as well as from outside. <clears throat> He fights to control our colonies, colonies' population, immigration, ownership of land, and expansion. He's made it difficult to practice the law here, wanting himself to be the ultimate judge, 
jury, and potential executioner. He sent over crooks who he calls judges to dispense his will through courts without trial or without jury. He's created new offices whose staff beat business down through harassment to enforce his will upon us. He sent the army to watch over us and when we didn't need or want them. He's done everything to make his army bigger than our system of law and our ability to carry out justice. He refuses to acknowledge our own laws and tells us we have to follow his laws instead. In addition, for breaking up our military so as to make them vulnerable and controllable. There's also grievances for protecting any of the British military personnel by mock trial from going to jail for any other reason, allowing them to operate outside of their own law, so essentially giving them this diplomatic immunity, this military immunity over their actions, so essentially they could get out of jail free cards to do whatever they will or wanted to towards the American colonists without any fear of any type of repercussions or punishment. <clears throat> For cutting off our trade with other countries, for adding taxes without our consent, for taking away our rights to trial by jury in many cases, for kidnapping our citizens only to be tried and convicted outside our colonies and our own laws, for taking us one of England's provinces, removing our laws, forcing his own body of laws on us, and expanding its boundary and making it an example of rule of law others must follow or else. For taking away our charters, forms of legislature, that allow us to govern. For suspending our own laws and forcing his own system of justice down our throats. For disowning our government and for declaring war on us for having the desire to self-govern. He has overfished our waters, burnt up our towns, and destroyed the lives of many people within our colonies. Right this very moment, he's sending over very large mar armies of mission mercenaries with no mor morals to kill and to torture everyone. Now that he's ruined our laws, protecting the common man, if you think we've been repressed up to now, expect the worst you can imagine. He has kidnapped our citizens of our colony on the high seas and turned them in to his own soldiers only to fight their brothers and sisters here. He has manipulated people and groups within our colonies to fight each other and wants rule of law similar to those savage Native Americans who live by war, destroying everyone under any conditions. Guerrilla warfare is probably what they're talking about here, since war prior to that had been fought face to face, to face in broad daylight. So as you see here, you start seeing this, this, this insurrections and the use of guerrilla warfare not just civil warfare face to face. One of the things that we dealt with with the Native Americans when the colonists first started coming to what now became the United States was this unorthodox form of warfare with the Native American colon against the colonists. <clears throat> with every action above, we've petitioned and been told in return to suck it up. By this alone, it's time to stand up for ourselves as free people and to kick this tyrant alt. We don't like making waves, and we're warned England from time to time. We'll govern ourselves, reminding England the conditions of our own immigration and settling here. We've act, asked nicely, yet even when we've shown them how it's bad business for everyone, they just won't listen. So it's up to us to fight for our fundamental rights, and anyone who opposed to this, inside or out of our borders, is our enemy and anyone forging to expand civil liberties, our friend. So we the representatives of the people living within these unified states of America, gathered here under one roof, declare to the Supreme Judge of the world, we are free. We declare we are no longer under the British Crown's rule and all the political connections we hereby over. These free and independent states of America have full power to each build partnerships, do business, go to war, or negotiate peace. To show we mean what we say, we offer each other our lives, our fortunes, and our integrity. So as you can see here, they've established the, the argument is, we have tried to stay with you, England. 
you have done nothing but spit in our faces. Therefore, we have no choice but to disconnect and to to delete our relationships with you. And in this letter, they break down their grievances as to why this needs to happen. So there's a nice little overview. I didn't want to take and make this video too, too long, but I wanted to also give us an opportunity to, to at least have a foundation to kind of see how did the American colonists establish the, the argument towards King George? What were the initial arguments being made in the Declaration of Independence? What grievances were provided as evidence that have led to there being no other choice but to, to break away and the overall impact that has? So I hope you enjoyed this video. Moving forward, we're gonna be taking and balancing between looking at historical documents, looking at foundational documents, looking at Supreme Court cases, looking at historical acts, historical events that have happened throughout American history that have led to the foundations to what we had, what we have now, and also provide the precedent moving forward with future decisions, events, and so on and so forth. If you enjoyed this video, then uh, be, definitely subscribe. That way you can take and be able to get the link when I upload the topic 1.4, which we're going to be focusing on the Articles of Confederation, which was the first American Constitution, the first failed American Constitution. It's also known under the acronym of AOC. So we're going to be taking and looking at that that document in our next video, breaking down the good, the bad, the ugly pieces of it, and why it was so terrible and couldn't be fixed, and ultimately led to the second constitutional convention that led to the creation of what would become the United States Constitution. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and until next time, have a good one.